Hey guys, what's up? Aru, is Mavika going to die? Man, I can't believe I'm saying that. But yes, there is a high chance that Mavika is going to die if she uses her Gnosis and smashes the Abyss back to, well, the Abyss. But there is quite a lot of things that you might not know about how this is going to stop that. Like Capitano's possible plan to change the past, the true name of the Night King, or the reason behind Capitano stealing Sorians and Phlogiston, or the fact that Annihilation has always been within the game ever since the time of dragons. There's also the Eclipse in Natland that has an eerie similarity to Conria's Dark Sun dynasty, Mavuika's final play, sacrificing herself by using up all of Natland's memories, finally how these little dots connect to the ancient dragons' elemental power to beat the Abyss, as well as how the first humans made their own combined power using memories based on that. We're going back to Enkanomiya and Enjo with this one, so as always, timestamps will be down below. Now hold on to your seats, pull out the lore books from 1.0, and let's get theorizing. Starting off with Mavuika's name, something I've noticed in the 5.1 trailer is that they finally referred to her by her name instead of just saying Pyro Archon. The pronunciation of her name is Mahuika or Mawika, much like the Maori fire deity that we've theorized before. TLDR Mawika in Maori myths hold the secret of fire and is the sister of the goddess of the night. Now based on the trailer, the Lord of the Night seems to be referring to the first Pyro Archon, Shbalanke. Mavika mentions him and the rules in conjunction with the Night Kingdom, so we can assume that much from the trailer and their identities. Moving on to Mavika's 500 year plan and how it barely worked because honestly it's at a disadvantage when you're up against the abyss. That plan is pretty much a hit or miss since no one really expects to know how it works, or whether or not the Abyss would even have the ability to choose. Now based on Molani and Atea, the Abyss is a cunning foe, not because it's intelligent or smart, but rather because it's unthinking and it manipulates whatever it finds to its advantage. Much like a hive mind that breaks down whatever it finds and then uses that to improve its abilities. Not by some logic or thinking, but through some sort of natural selection within itself. If you played the StarCraft series, then you might understand the mindless logic behind what the Abyss might be. But other than Mavuika's plan, we also have Capitano's plan to go back in time, theoretically, but we'll go back to that later. Next up is ancient names and forging them that are under the jurisdiction and power of Shilonen. He not only is an ancient name bearer herself, but her ancient name is an awakened one. A name that holds Mavuika's plan 500 years ago, just like Molani with Tupac and the other unique heroes. Now the name that she might have been bestowed is the name of Sunjata, which is part of the same six heroes that went on to save Natlan and creating the Mari Jibari. One of her scenes is also the forging of an ancient name, not in the Archon Quest but from the likely Chronicle series in her tribe, which if you could still remember had something to do with the upstarting ancient name forger that is also a big fan of Shilonen. The quest also mentions blaze gem inscriptions that keep inscribed names that would never fade, but sadly it only functions more like a cool pseudo-ancient name trinket or souvenir rather than the real ones. Next up, Ororon is our first ever tall male electro bow user, and I'm anxious to know why he's being coerced into helping the captain of all people. Anyway, he's the same guy that Capitano was talking to at the end of the Archon quest and he is also the one who saved Capitano by using the purple mist at Mawika. Something worth noting is that Mawika could have just dispersed the smoke if she wanted to, but she chose not to because she sensed something within Capitano after their duel. A few words that might have been mentioned by him are this. His soul is temporarily restrained by us and it appears to have become more fragile in the process. Now this may refer to either Capitano himself while they were in the Night Kingdom scene, or he could be talking about Shibalanke, which is more likely since Mavika used the same sacred flame or transparent flame against the Abyss. Now there's a scene where the Fatui are actually fighting against the Abyss and also moving into the stadium. So we can assume that they're going to help us in some way, but there's also the chance that the Fatui aren't helping and just want to get to the Gnosis first. Whether or not the Fatui in that land are actually helping us is still unknown, but what about Capitano himself? And once you've learned the truth that the Pyro Archon Mawika would never willingly share with you, you may just find it in your heart to consider my proposal. We have to make the decision for her, here and now. We presume too much. Humanity's survival is worth any price. If I could go back, I would do whatever it took to ensure their survival. 
Remember when I told you about Mawika's plan being bad and that Capitano has his own plan to save Natlan? Yeah, well this is where it's at and it involves changing the rules of Natlan and going back to the past, at least based on Capitano in the trailer. From what we know so far, Capitano is quite regretful of what happened 500 years ago and wishes he could go back and change that. Now this does not shed any light to whatever his actual plan and proposal is, but we can make a theory based on that. His points for saving humanity at any cost is worth noting, but going back to where the abyss was at its peak and then changing the events there is nigh impossible for even an Archon to do. Even if the top 3 Harbingers have similar power levels to Archons, changing history and fate is not an easy feat. We've known multiple times from Nicole, Caribert, Scaramouche, Nahida, and Fossilor that it takes the most patience, fortitude, and more importantly, the right people to make it work. And if you've noticed, Mawika has already been doing that since 500 years ago with the ancient names of heroes. You can say that it's a similar plan to Fosalor and how she had Nouvellet, Rina, and the Traveler play their parts in her grand show, but Capitano's plan, although we don't know it fully just yet, is still quite undercooked. And that's not to say that it's bad, but you would need to replace something that happened during the first Pyro Archon's time instead, which is thousands of years ago. See, Natlan's survival and continued life is reliant on four things. The Night Kingdom with its Wyavs, the Night King, which is likely Shabalanke, the first Pyro Archon, the rules of war, and the people's beliefs. And without those four, which are the cornerstones of Natlan, then the land is doomed from the start. If you want to change all of these four, you would need to find a suitable replacement of equal importance or it would be torn from time completely and much like what happened with Scaramouche and Ruka Devata and what happened in Honkai Impact with our friend Otto. Something I'm sure that you might have missed in Genshin lore is the Three Realms Gateway offering in Enkanomiya. Remember when Enjo was explaining the way elemental creatures hate the abyss and when Sumi explained the solution to stop that? Yeah, that event is honestly the first ever iteration of annihilation within the game. Something that Fontaine, Sumeru, and now the Traveler also has, but is apparently already a known strategy to combat the abyss for a very, very long time. But the reason I'm bringing this up now is that the Dragon Lords and their super advanced civilization might have already had their own annihilation before humanity even ever existed. It's worth noting that the Abyss and the Dragons were already enemies since before humanity even existed. We already know that elemental energy is the best and most effective way to combat the Abyss and the Dragon Lords are quite literally the peak of raw elemental power. It's just that today, elemental energy has dissipated to such low levels for humanity to survive. Talking about chess real quick, the Pyronosis is either a knight, a bishop, or a king. Sadly, I'm not a chess player at all, so I'm not gonna make any inferences through Winter Knight's Dazo, but I can decipher how a Gnosis can be used to make an Annihilation reaction. First of all, the only way for an Abyssal invasion of this scale to happen is only by deactivating the Sacred Flame, which in this case, Mawika has done in a possible last resort to consolidate the remaining elemental energy to punch the ever-loving crap out of the Abyss. That basically explains why all this is happening and why Mawika is sitting right in the middle of the stadium where the Sacred Flame's fire has run out and interestingly is also where the portal of the Abyss starts. This is also why we need to fight the monsters coming out of the Abyss since we don't want any more of that to spread all over Natlan while Mawika channels her power. The Gnosis that Mawika is holding is, in a sense, a trinket that stores all the memories of people and heroes that gave themselves to the flame to become the Pyro Archon. Basically, every Pyro Archon's memories. We've seen its use in full display after Mawika used all her souvenirs to break into the Night Kingdom with just her mind. The intangible thought of breaking into the Night Kingdom. Using the Gnosis and smashing the Abyss portal would mean shattering all the accumulated memories of Netland's heroes and using it as a huge memory bomb on the Abyss. Which works quite well similarly to an Annihilation, but the memories and the stories of the past are converted to fuel into the Pyro Gnosis. Now to my understanding, there's four ways to create an Annihilation with the Abyss. One with raw and primordial elemental energy, two with the memories converted into energy, 3. The way the Traveler absorbs the Abyss within them, and 4. Whatever Celestia is doing with their own memory bombs, functioning similarly but quite catastrophically in comparison. 
Remember also when Ruka Devata sacrificed her life force to stop the forbidden knowledge. It's quite similar to giving her time and memory to annihilate the abyss from Sumeru. Going back to the name Malipo, meaning payment in the game, Mawika's life force is quite honestly the only proper payment for having the entirety of Netlan trudge through and keep fighting for that long. Mawika left them during the cataclysm and then came back 500 years later to pay back the debt she owed to all of the people of Netlan. Solar eclipses in Mesoamerican, African, and Polynesian myths are in summary a sign of disputes that needed to be dealt with, the displeasure of the sun gods, the death of their royal leaders, and even a time where skeletal warriors would appear and devour the sun. Now all of these concepts are present in Natland through the Night Kingdom, the Archons likely sacrifice, the Abyss creatures, and even the dispute between Mawika and Capitano. Now about this glowing circle here and why it looks so similar to the Narwhal's portal in Fontaine. Hey, hear me out. I think that there's a connection between Natlan's Night Kingdom and the last dynasty of Kanria right before the Cataclysm happened or right before the Five Sinners decided to become the Five Sinners. Within the game itself, we've seen a similar form of blue eclipses before. Not the purple eclipses that Skirk has, and not the lunar crimson moon of Arlecchino, but the blue solar eclipse of the all-devouring narwhal, which if you could remember was Sertologi's pet, named after the Flame of Surtur, a flame giant that was destined to destroy the kingdom of Asgard in Norse mythology. We've known already that Norse and sometimes Greek and Christian names hail from the abyss and the old civilization. Kanria and Enkanomia are one such examples. But for Sertology specifically, it's likely that this is the symbol for the Dark Sun. Or at least the Dark Sun before it was engulfed in the abyss. And this Dark Sun might also be similar to the Night Kingdom, minus the current abyssal corruption it's experiencing. Bear in mind that the abyssal manifestations of Saurians and Natlanians are actually corrupted forms of what should have been pure souls and memories of the Night Kingdom. And the abyssal monsters from the Night Kingdom are the same as the monsters that the Narwhal creates after feeding on the Primordial Sea, which is essentially where all of Fontaine's memories are, as well as creation. But that doesn't mean that it's a new phenomenon. Inazuma manifests its ghost of the past through the Sakura trees, which in itself holds memories of Inazuma. And the abyss rooms in Sumeru are technically the same, just that they were already in physical form when their memories were corroded. Liwe has karmic debt and its ghost that the Yaksha fight, which are manifestations of themselves in memory. And Mondstadt has... I don't know, actually. They have Venti, so the abyss can't really get through that easily. Or can they? Just a final segment here, there's a new area in Natlan, possibly in the Nanatskayan tribe that's slowly responsible for forging, which is where we'll meet Shalonan in the last Chronicle quest. Interestingly, there's a Fatui version of the forge in Natlan already, and they might have been making their own ancient names by coercing Ororon and making him steal some ancient names for Capitano. Ororon is from the Masters of the Nightwind, and just like Sitlali, they can communicate with the Night Kingdom as a built-in skill. And there we go, my thoughts on the 5.1 trailer and how I think the story is going to pan out. If you enjoyed the video, please do leave a like, comment down below your thoughts, and subscribe and hit the bell if you haven't yet since you watched all the way to the end. Now I'm quite late in this video and we usually get around a week's time before the actual patch, so I'm curious to see whether or not Capitano is simply regretful of the past or is actually going to do something about it, and whether or not Mawika is actually going to die in 5.1. Things are picking up quite a bit in the current story so here's to seeing Natlan's solar eclipse and how it would affect the region. Now that's gonna be it for me. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? So like, comment, if you enjoyed, subscribe, hit the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!